Um, we're here today to talk to you about net zero carbon, um, which is something that Simon and I are both very, very passionate about. So this is a great opportunity just to say hi and give you a nice overview of what that's all about. So let's jump into right so this is um, a slide I use quite often when I'm dealing with different project teams with the varying amount of understanding of the climate emergency and general sustainability um, I think it's a really nice um, image that well quite a scary image but one that really highlights the problem that we're facing at the moment um, as as an industry and as a world in general so obviously COVID has been a significant challenge for us all um, and then we have the recession which we're, we're all talking about rising prices and interest rates at the moment and then in the background we have climate change and as you can see it's a much bigger issue and it's coming down the path um, and it's something we need to be getting on top of as soon as possible and we're seeing a huge amount of momentum in this area at the moment and Simon and I will both talk about that a little bit as part of today's presentation okay so our challenge over the next 40 years, um, they estimate that 230 billion square meters of new buildings will be constructed around the world. That is a huge amount of construction. And we need to be doing things differently if we're going to mitigate against climate change. We now widely accept that there is a risk and things are changing. There's been all sorts of um, tangible events that have happened in recent years from forest fires and droughts that have really highlighted the problem across the world. As a result, regulations are increasing and I'm sure you've all heard of new targets coming through. I think one of the, the ones coming down line very quickly in the UK is we've got the new Part L in June and the impacts that's gonna have on, on new build residential schemes is, is starting to be understood and factored in. We're making things differently, we have to. That's a really important part of, of meeting our, of the challenge. We've also seen um, a change on the financial side of things. And as a construction specialist, I, I know that the, the money always talks and it's certainly been the case um, on recent developments. The ESG, so the Environmental and Social Governance Agenda, has really stood up and is listening to the risks of climate change at the moment. So we're finding on a number of especially larger developments, unless you can show you're considering net zero and wider ESG factors, they're not lending the money for the developments anymore. So it's something we're all having to think about a lot harder now. We're also seeing more scrutiny on performance. So you can no longer use greenwashing and just talk the talk. You actually have to be able to back that up with the raw data. Um, some of the things Simon and I will talk to you about today, explore that in a bit more detail about the methodologies that are available to help you to do that. So there's some really exciting opportunities out there if you can put the legwork in as well. So. This is a slide I actually borrowed from one of my colleagues, but I think it's um, quite a powerful one because it shows all of the different things around net zero um, that we're seeing come online. So the London plan is a really big factor in the UK. Um, it's gone through a few updates in the last year or so, which have really pushed the net zero agenda. So if you're doing projects under the GLA, you'll see that the requirements that this sets have now stepped up a big step and there's a lot more that you have to do. More than 200 councils around the UK have declared a climate emergency and we're seeing more things come through under planning policy with regards to what they're expecting you to do when you're developing in their areas. So it's always something that you need to check up on because the portals are being updated quite regularly now with increasing requirements. Um, I've actually seen a couple of the local authorities referring back to the London plan as well as a way of looking at best practice. So you might find the London plan requirements start to go out into other areas um, around the UK too. Um, and I mentioned the future home standard. So that's that's something that's on our radar at the moment in the residential arena as well. Um, okay. So in terms of national policy, where are we? So we have to do a 78% reduction in UK carbon emissions by 2037, with an aim of getting to 100% by 2050. Um, now that's compared to 1990 levels, so they had to set a, a line somewhere in terms of measuring a change. 
the graph on the right hand side of this slide gives you an idea of where the carbon currently sits. So you can see transportation is a big part of that with 33% and energy supply at 27. Agriculture is actually only responsible for 4% according to those stats. So it might be a bit smaller than perhaps you were expecting. Um, this is the beauty of when you start digging into the detail. So construction is what we're here to talk about today. And when it comes to net zero carbon in buildings, there are two main areas that you need to consider. The first one is the operational carbon, and that's related with running a building. The second is the embodied carbon, which is to do with constructing and maintaining the building. I'm going to talk you through operational carbon over the next couple of slides, and then I'll hand over to Simon, who's going to talk to you about the embodied carbon side of things. So just as a, a, a quick kickoff, um, the two different parts of the carbon equation um, are illustrated quite interestingly in this graph, which was taken by the RICS carbon profiling report. The orange shows you the embodied carbon and the grey shows you the operational and you can see that overall there's a lot more embodied than there is operational. Now the reason behind that in my opinion is because we're much much better at dealing with operational carbon and building regulations have been pushing for improvements on this for an awful long time whereas embodied carbon is a relatively new player in the arena and we're only really ramping up our activities in this area at the moment. Um, I'll let Simon talk to you about that in a lot more detail shortly, but it's just something to bear in mind. Um, as it stands at the moment, the regulations still primarily focus on operational carbon. So we're looking to squeeze that 18 and that 15% even further, um, but, but we are where we are for the time being, okay? Um, another important thing just to note actually is the, the bright orange is the embodied carbon associated with a notional office building up to practical completion. And then the 32% is over the life cycle. So actually by the time you've built your office building, 35% of the carbon has already been expelled, you've already done it. So that's what's so important about engaging during the construction process. Okay, so when we talk about operational carbon, we look at regulated and unregulated. Now, the regulated is something that's covered by Part L. So if you're looking at a residential unit, you'll be looking at the SAP calculations. If you're looking at a commercial unit, you'll be looking at the Bruckel calculations, all done as part of your building reg submission. So that looks at things like heating and cooling. If you're putting renewables on and using those, they'll help you towards your target. But there's a real push for a fabric first approach in order to minimize the energy that's needed in the first place and then you look at efficiencies and trying to improve those where you can. Unregulated operational carbon is anything that the building will use when it's operating that's not covered by building regs. So that might be your small power equipment, so your computers and things like that. It could be if you had a swimming pool, that would be a, a big source of unregulated energy as well. So it's all of those bits and pieces that building regs doesn't cover and, and minimizing those. So as I said before, the regulations have been in place for an awful long time, but we are now focusing in on the unregulated energy in a lot more detail. So there are various things available. TM54 modeling is something that our, our team here use in order to establish what the unregulated energy is and what you can do to minimize it. There's also the Neighbours Scheme, which I know is more widely spoken about. That's been introduced quite recently within the UK and is gaining traction at the moment. So they're all words to, to bear in mind when we look in the realms of operational carbon. Um, I mentioned a fabric first approach. That's really important because it's a much more efficient way of minimising your energy in the first instance before you look at a more efficient type of technology in order to, to deal with that carbon that you're, you have to use because you can't design it out. <laughs> 
So efficient systems, and we look at energy management. So metering and monitoring, using the building management system to see what's using um, energy. It was really interesting over lockdown because actually there were quite a few buildings that had monitoring systems in place. And when there was nobody in those buildings, they were still using a huge amount of energy. So it can actually be a practical management issue. You go in and say, actually, turn off at six o'clock in the evening because there's nobody there then. So there's ways you can help to, to mitigate that in, the, in those respects. Uh, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't flag the importance of balancing carbon considerations with other aspects of a building. So you can have the most energy efficient building you could possibly produce, but actually for true sustainability, you need to think about the other factors too, such as health and well-being of the occupants. And it's all about striking a balance between those different areas to make sure you have a truly sustainable building. And I think that's my last slide. Simon, shall I stop sharing to let you share instead? Yeah, that'd be great, thank you. Perfect. Um, and Abby, can you see that? Okay, great, thank you. Um, yeah, so thanks, Abby, and uh, hello, everyone. So it's Simon from ADP Architects. So we want to cover how embodied carbon fits into the net zero agenda, but also just cover some strategies that, as a practice, we've been looking at to just generally address and start to consider embodied carbon to a certain, to a further degree. So embodied carbon, as I've touched on, is the carbon emissions associated with the materials and construction processes for a project. And to quantify that, we have to understand the life cycle associated with, with products and materials. So that includes the upfront carbon, um, sometimes referred to as um, cradle to, to practical completion. And that covers the processing um, from kind of raw material, transportation to manufacturing, transportation to site, and then the construction of the material within the overall building. Beyond that, there's the use stages. Uh, these are stages B1 to B5. And this further covers embodied carbon emissions associated with that in use. So aspects of maintenance, repair, replacement, or refurbishment. Beyond this, within embodied carbon, we also then have to consider at the end of the life of that product, what happens to it and how it's disposed. And then beyond that are life cycle stage D, which covers reuse, recovery, recycling uh, potential. And so the really key thing to um, understand about embodied carbon is that aspect that the first day a client or a building owner takes that key, opens the door to their new building before they've even turned on a light switch or turned on the heating, that building already has a substantial carbon footprint that needs to be addressed. And that's the really kind of key thing of why we need to be considering embodied carbon within what we're doing. <clears throat> so why should we be measuring it? Essentially similar to Operation Energy, if we continue to build buildings the way we previously have, we don't quantify or verify the performance, then there's just not enough offsetting available in the UK or even at a global scale to be able to kind of get us out of that problem. And then so focusing on operational energy only covers part of the picture. So the graphs on the left, similar to what Abby showed previously, a typical build, office building, building it just to building regulation compliance is a relatively poor performing building. So the yellow section is representing the operational energy and it shows that that on a poor performing building is the most significant element of, of carbon. When we now compare that to buildings that we should be delivering now, which are really low energy in their operational performance, as a whole, that operational energy is a lot smaller and um, part of the overall uh, picture and embodied carbon is the biggest contributor so that's some that kind of shows why we really need to be addressing this and if we aren't considering it you know can we really call buildings net zero and i think one of the really key aspects to embodied carbon that everyone that has some sort of involvement in a construction project is likely to be able to 
to have some sort of responsibility. And that goes back to clients, really early strategic decisions when there's the potential for a building project to, to solve an issue. You know, is a new building actually needed or is there the opportunities for retrofit and repurposing existing buildings? And some of those really early strategic decisions are what can make the biggest difference on where you might end up at, in terms of an embodied carbon footprint. So some of the reasons why we also we need to measure embodied carbon is that if we just approach this by assuming or guessing, that can be really dangerous. Um, and there's lots of, you know, we can make assumptions that timber is better to use than, than concrete, but we need to really be able to quantify this and understand the processes. And some examples, um, a project we're involved in as a technical um, advisor, there was a discussion with the contractor about the use and the specification of concrete with uh, cement replacement. And in this instance, um, cement replacement concrete had been specified, but the contractor couldn't source that from the concrete plant, which was closest to the site. So there was a suggestion that if they had to go further afield, that would negate the benefit of having the cement replacement. And there's some logic there where we could have said, yeah, that, that sounds about right. Let's just use the, the plant that's closest. But the better approach is that let's measure it and quantify it and put a bit more behind that decision. So as a practice, we make use of, of one-click software um, to, to measure these things. And we can quite quickly put into the software specifications for concrete. In this instance, we are comparing the same similar specifications of concrete, but one with the cement replacement. And we were able to look at looking at a quantity 400 meter cubed of concrete in this instance, um, roughly kind of where the closest concrete plant was to site could produce about 141 tons of CO2. We then compared that to the same specification, but with the cement replacement, same quantities and playing around with those transport figures, we were able to prove that a contractor would have to actually go as far as 200 kilometers to get to a point where there was no further benefit of that. And I think you'd probably be quite unlucky if uh, you went from, if you had to go that far to, to get your concrete. So there's actually quite a few other options that the contractor can, to, could consider. And then another example, maybe a bit, bit closer to sort of the everyday decisions. Um, there's a really great book by Simon Sturgis called Targeting Zero. And he puts forward this example on, on hot drinks. So if you just think about the ingredients of, of hot drinks and actually start to think about tea, coffee, you know, where does it come from? Quite often this comes from the other side of the world. So there's you know, huge transport um, distances involved in, in that. Whereas milk, I think everyone's probably fairly familiar with uh, the fact that the, the um, dairy industry has quite considerable carbon footprint, but then milk is, is produced kind of on our, on our doorstep. <clears throat> But then when you start to kind of get into actually measuring it and quantifying it and understanding those processes, things like tea and coffee do come from a huge distance, but they have incredibly long shelf lives. They don't require refrigeration. So actually transporting tea and coffee is relatively low carbon. And when it's compared to that of, of the dairy industry, it's a lot more insignificant to milk. So, Anyone that's sat there with a black tea, black coffee in front of them, you'll you pat yourself on the back, but anyone who has some uh, hot milk before bed, you might want to start to, to reconsider what you're drinking. There's a book uh, called How Bad Are Bananas by Mike Berners-Lee, and anyone that's kind of interested in understanding some more of those kind of everyday decisions around kind of carbon footprints, it's, uh, it makes a really good read. <clears throat> so what do we measure embodied carbon against? Uh, well, essentially, as Abby touched on, um, embodied carbon and measuring it is, is relatively new and there's not really any legislation out there which is saying that buildings have to meet these certain targets. They are looking to uh, develop a, there's a proposed building regulations part Z, which will start to identify targets around embodied carbon, but that's not in place yet and it's been debated. So at the moment, what we have to look towards are guidance that's being issued by other bodies. So 
This is typically the ROBA and Letty. <clears throat> Um, more recently, both those organisations have done some work to align their targets, which were um, a bit different than their kind of original issues. The RIBA has targets which are slightly phased, so targets around 2025 and then improved targets towards 2030. Whereas Letty has done a bit more work looking at uh, specific typologies of buildings, so office, residential, education. And the most recent um, guidance from Letty. They've adopted this banding system. So this is done to start to present embodied carbon similar to the way we understand energy performance in terms of the kind of G to A banding that you quite often see on energy certificates. <clears throat> at the moment, Letty suggests that buildings, a typical building at the moment is around band kind of E and F and what we should be at least striving for at the moment, buildings that have been designed now is at least uh, band C, with these future aspirations of where we could get to following more significant changes on kind of grid decarbonisation, better access and development within uh, circular life cycle and circular economy principles. <clears throat> In the context of, of net zero, essentially, if we want to consider net zero embodied carbon, we have to be able to quantify all of the materials within project and this typically follows the RICS guidance using bills of quantities and mapping the carbon to everything that's quantified in those bills of quantities <clears throat> but what we don't always have the opportunity to do that it's kind of quite rare to we're, not, we're starting to see it change um, to actually have these requirements in briefs but so even if we aren't actually having the undertaking the scope to quantify all of it. There's lots of strategies that we can undertake to make sure that we are considering the embodied carbon. And one of the really key things is this early stage, high level massing. We've kind of mentioned before about the early decisions are really key at that sort of strategic level. But when design teams take on, on projects, considering the size of the, size of the building, uh, footprint, numbers of stories, and getting down to more specifics around things like structural strategies, structure, superstructure and substructure is one of the biggest contributions to embodied carbon. So if it, considering things like what's the ideal structural solution and how does that work with potentially a grid you know, structure, um, we can get much more efficient when we use it in the right way. So forcing timber to work on a, on a grid that it's not designed to might not necessarily be the, the right solution. <clears throat> But when we do these assessments, we want to be doing them at stages that make the most difference. So making sure that we're doing these before our IBA stage four, because it's not just about retrospectively understanding what a carbon footprint building is, but it's about it's building into our workflows to make sure that we can um, respond to it and look at alternative options where we can reduce the embodied carbon. As a practice, when we sort of start projects, we look at identifying the right Everybody carbon strategy for that for that scheme, depending on the sort of size and the scale of it. And that may mean when we're looking at schools, we rather than quantifying the whole building, we can focus our study on a typical, typical bay or a typical wing of that project. We've also then done studies um, looking at certain packages. So understanding, um, comparing, say, metal cladding against timber cladding or render or, or brickwork. <clears throat> So there's ways to sort of start to kind of make it fit more into your workflow and not make it, um, not turn it into a huge, huge task. Beyond that, there's also strategies without necessarily quantifying your actual building, but things we can do to better inform our decisions. So we can just compare one meter squared of different buildups. So for an example, one meter squared of an external wall, but what's really key when we're doing these comparisons is making sure that we're comparing things like for like. So on an external wall, we're making sure that we're comparing like for like in terms of thermal performance, any fire requirements, acoustics, robustness. It's really key that we, we consider all of these things within it, because if we don't, then potentially your results aren't going aren't to tell you the right thing. <clears throat> 
Um, EPDs is a really kind of good way to kind of get a bit of a snapshot. So EPDs are these environmental product declarations. And the really key thing about this is that they're independently produced certifications on products. And so if you can get hold of EPDs for two different products, you can look at the figures and start to make some decisions about what's the, the better product. Manufacturers are getting better at producing these, but one of the things we try to do when we, when we have sort of suppliers come into the office is to really encourage them, if they haven't already, to undertake this process. And then there's loads, there's a whole host of tools out there to, to help you. And I mentioned that we use one click in-house and that makes use of EPDs for its, for its data sets. But there's lots of free tools out there. Um, you just have to kind of be, be careful with where the, where the information comes from. This one example here is the material pyramid. So this provides a kind of hierarchy of materials gradually getting to higher embodied carbon towards the top. So the bottom you typically see your more natural materials such as timber, whereas at the top you have kind of aluminium. But going back to my kind of first point on, on this page about like for like, Sometimes when you see these diagrams, the material pyramid works on the amount of carbon for a kilogram of material. So you have to think about how that material gets used. So a kilogram of timber on, uh, say, an external cladding may, go, may not go as far as a kilogram of aluminium. So going back to that, make sure we're comparing things like for like as they would be used on a project. So to bring it back around to this idea of net zero in, in embodied carbon, the really key thing to consider is that it's like the idea of, of offsetting to bring you back to this net zero position isn't a kind of get out of jail free card. And offsetting is something that should be done to the unavoidable emissions. So we have to do everything in our power to make sure that our embodied carbon is as low as possible in the first place. And then those unavoidable ones, unavoidable emissions are what we can then consider offsetting. Um, UK GBCs, um, which a lot of the kind of the guidance and uh, definitions around net zero, and their approach to offsetting is that there's two key criteria that you can look at. One, which is the compensation. So that's where carbon emission savings are achieved elsewhere, reducing emissions, but doesn't reduce the actual atmospheric carbon levels. Alternatively, perhaps what we're kind of more familiar with when we talk about offsetting neutralization, which is where carbon is removed from the atmosphere. So typically that is looking at um, sort of tree planting initiatives. But one of the key things, um, stated in the, the UK GBC, it's about that this, if this is going to be the approach, it needs to be done through the approved frameworks, such as the UK Woodland Carbon Code. Um, so I think just to start to kind of summarise it, I think one of the key things um, about net zero is that we just need to be honest and clarify what the definitions are that, that we're working to. So we've talked today about net zero construction and embodied carbon, but also net zero in operational energy. And we shouldn't be ashamed to, to, to say that this building is only net zero in construction or net zero in operational. These are great things to, to achieve, but we just need that clarity because net zero isn't just something about getting the certificate for it in the kind of lowest possible definition, but it's about that wider picture we're doing this because climate change is, is a real issue and so we just need that kind of industry that kind of clarity around what we're talking about when we, when we mention that zero anyway. um abby is there anything else you wanted to mention somewhere no i think that covers it all really nicely thank you simon there haven't been any questions added into the Q&A at the moment. I don't know whether that's because you guys can't access it or if we've just answered everything with all of the detail we've given you already. Um, so please do feel free to put questions into the, the Q&A. Oh, I think Stuart's just said the same in the, in the chat box. Um, I have a couple of questions. If you don't mind me keeping off. Um, to begin with, um, Thank you very much, Abby and Simon, for, um, for I thought 
really excellent talk. I think you, you brought up well, you brought up a lot of questions, and I've been scribbling them down. And I think I have um, sort of one question for each of you, uh, which I think you can collectively uh, answer or give a, give a go at at least. I guess for Abby, I I was looking. Um, I, I picked up on a few of your, of your points about sort of how carbon is going to be taxed, how the regulations are going to form up. And um, of course, we're looking at the energy industry and transport, and they're talking about shipping as well, which is taxed at based on tonnage. But of course, in, in construction, we benefit from the fact that it's a project-based, uh, and actually a project-based activity, which has a lot of um, certification and permissions and planning regulation service. So, so it seems more appropriate in, in many ways easier, but it, it's difficult to get a picture of how this regulatory um, taxation, whatever, how the regulations about taxation is going to evolve over the years, how, how people speculate it might evolve. Um, yeah. So I, I, I have that, that question for you. I'll, I'll get both of my questions out of the way. Yeah, of course, do, do you want me to jump in, George? So it's a really good point. And actually, historically, we've been really good at dealing with when you're changing a building or building a new one, that's when we can set the requirements to, to be met. Um, there has been an awful lot of talk in recent um, months and years about existing buildings because they make up the majority of the stock that will still be here in 2030. And actually, if you think of net zero in 2050, our existing building stock will probably, if you think commercial buildings, they will be um, refreshed at least twice between now and then. So the way that's being tackled is through the building regs in terms of the energy performance you have to have in place. So under the, the housing associations at the moment are looking at bringing all of their stock up to a better standard. They have to. And it's the same with the commercial stock. You have to improve your I think you've got to get it to an EPC of B by a certain time frame. And if you haven't, you're not going to be able to lease or um, sell your buildings. I don't know if that's exactly right, but I know that they have increased the requirements requirements it's not my specialist area I just I manage people that have that as a specialism so I, I have a good overview of it in regards to um existing buildings and, and how they are dealt with the neighbor scheme looks at um, a building in use so they're, they're going to have to report on their energy consumption as part of what their operations are that's coming down line very quickly i think so there will be movement there has to be otherwise we will not hit our target for 2030 or 2050. does that answer your question george You go some way. Thank you very much. Yes. I, mean, that's great. I have a question for Simon as well, and then I'm going, once I finish with my question, I am going to shift over to the questions being asked by our participants. Um, but Simon, I was really <clears throat> I was really struck by the fact that you mentioned um, the uh, the one click approach to LCA and I and it's been the, the, the program that we've been teaching our students here at Brooks. And the reason why we've chosen it, <clears throat> and some, something else you touched upon, is this idea of using big data. Uh, you didn't use those words, but that's effectively what it is. In other words, for each <clears throat> item that you specify, you would certainly have an almost precise <clears throat> idea about how much embodied in DPD, which is, of course, what one click uh, is selling its software based upon, the fact that it has a constantly updated um, database, which you you can actually specify what what locate what type of concrete where the concrete is coming for where the concrete is coming from and sort of all of a sudden you can um, in an iterative way so you're continuously upgrading it's a continuous process where you're constantly upgrading your estimate that they're both embodied and operational um, carbon so anyway I just wanted to if you could just expand on that and comment that not really a question but it's more of a of a, just a, a request for further exploration. Oh, I'm not, can you rephrase the question? I wasn't sure what the question was. <laughs> not a question. Uh, could, shall I jump in? Because Simon and I were actually talking about some of the software stuff before the call, weren't we, Simon? Yes. And so I know you guys use one click. We use eTool. And I can see Harry's asked a question about free calculators as well. So 
in the UK, one click and eTool are the big ones that are used all the time. And they go through quite a detailed third party accreditation. And they do, you're right, George, they have a huge amount of data inside them. It's essentially a really big database that the software companies keep up to date all the time. Now, from mine and Simon's perspective, that's really important because when we're advising clients about embodied carbon, we need to know it's right. And we pay a lot of license fee for, to these different organizations. And then that's their responsibility it's up to date it's saying the right thing um, so it is big data but it is editable as well to a certain extent George so you will change the quantity of the material that's going in and as Simon showed you earlier you can change you can experiment with the distance it's come from which will then the software calculates what that does to the embodied carbon so they're really user-friendly approaches to help you get into the nitty-gritty detail of those of the, the actual calculations with regards to free calculators Harry you're question in the chat go really careful and um, there's some really great high level ones out there that we've seen as an organization and i think having a free um calculator tool is wonderful but you need to be cautious and if you're using it for detailed calculations um, i don't think you can um, we've done an exercise where we've compared some of the free software with eTool in the past and there's been massive discrepancies so I don't think you want to be making especially not with offsetting and things like that you need to be really comfortable with the data that you've got there um, as a high level starting point I, I don't see any issue with that the fact you're asking the question and you're looking at it is what I would always encourage but when you start looking at a formal declaration with UK GBC or under the GLA requirements I think you need to be using the proper software that's accredited you wouldn't be able to submit under Briam for example or others without having that level of, of comfort of the accreditation um have you got anything to add to that Simon I think I was just going to add I mean, what's quite interesting about the, 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 the data sets that you have access to is things like um we haven't really sort of gone into kind of verification of, of net zero and there's the, the aspect of yeah, specifically net zero in operational energy we don't hand over a building and it's net zero at that point, there's that process of understanding how does the building actually perform um, and how do we then compare that to any kind of offsetting or, or renewables. And, that, and actually what's quite interesting is that quite often a lot of the projects we're working on sort of schools and things like that aren't up to full occupancy for kind of five or six years after they start. So kind of at what point can you actually kind of verify this? But that verification also comes back to embodied carbon. So within those sort of data sets that exist, products have certain lifespans. So if you're thinking about when you're doing an embodied carbon assessment on a project, you predict that say the carpet might be replaced every 10 years, which means it will be, you'll have that aspect of embodied carbon added every, every 10 years, like if you're considering 60 years. But what you need to kind of understand from a, from a kind of a client point of view is they they always need to kind of understand these these assumptions because if that carpet ends up getting replaced every five years then your embodied carbon calculations are way off so there is sort of things that within the kind of the data sets that are available you really need to kind of think about and, and make sure that there's almost this element of kind of being able to hand over these that we were talking about kind of we really talked about material passports and things, but making sure that the owners understand these kind of calculations and what their kind of responsibility is to kind of manage embodied carbon and how that aligns or potentially doesn't align with the sort of data sets that are available in different places. I think that links in with the operational stuff as well, Simon, because I know we've been doing this for a long time. And one of our frustrations is actually the calculation you do for operational energy for building regs is so far away from what the reality is when that building's in use. There's a massive gap there. And that's where the unregulated energy comes into it, too. So we need to be closing that gap and making sure that our, our properties in use really are analysed. So going back to your point earlier, George, as well, on the on the ongoing carbon energy everything essentially do we want to pick up some of the questions from the um the q a so i can see there's one about epds how do epds work do you want to pick that one up simon yeah that's fine yeah so environmental performance declarations so essentially they are there's a number of companies that undertake those for a manufacturer and they will go into 
they'll kind of basically interrogate the manufacturers to understand that their, their process is involved in generating their material. So it goes back to that kind of life cycle of products. What are the raw materials? What's the processing involved? What's the transportation involved? And essentially it will calculate what's called the CO2E or the CO2 equivalent. So all the uh, kind of global warming potential from that product, which includes things um, such as uh, kind of methane and other things which contribute to it, but it calculates it um, back to a kind of a CO2 equivalent, but over the life cycles of, of, a, of a product. But you do have to, um, that's kind of one of the things where it's kind of worth getting into the, the detail of EPD. So we've, um, we worked on a project that included EPDs and that had, that assumed the carbon that was associated with that product, assumed that at the end of the life cycle, it was a timber product, but that timber would then be used in a, um, um, would be burnt to produce energy. And that factor of it kind of being, there was some energy benefit at the end of the life cycle was factored into that carbon equation that was in the, the EPD. But then that's another instance where if the client's not aware that that should happen and that timber isn't disposed of in that way, then those figures aren't quite right. So it is quite important to have a read through EPDs and see what the assumptions are within that. So you could potentially link that into almost like a building user guide, couldn't you, Simon, so that you have all these different materials. This is what it was assuming you were going to do with them. Yeah, definitely. And there's, I mean, there's a lot of uh, companies out there, especially around kind of ceilings and carpets that are developing their kind of circular economy principles. So they were, are about to when that carpet needs replacing or the ceiling needs replacing, they will come along, they will take the ceilings down, they will take them back and refurbish them or recycling them. And so things like that, that the client needs to be aware that that's in place and should, should take advantage of. There is another question here. Should I, should I read it out? Um, do you want, do you think the legislation will catch up with climate change mitigation requirements? For example, at the moment, the ESOS system is only reporting, and most companies seem to view this as an additional tax and annoyance. That's it. It so I'll just jump in and say absolutely. I think I, I kind of covered that earlier with one of my comments. I think the legislation will have to catch up because if we're going to hit net zero, we need to be looking to 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 make the requirements set on more than just the new buildings and refurbishment buildings it needs to be covering everything in use as well and I think that's coming down the line at the moment there's a real momentum around retrofit at the moment and I just see that increasing um, as we move forwards so if you've got anything to, you want to add to that Simon okay we've got one other one George do you want to read it through yeah sure I'll read it uh, it's from Chris Ryder uh, do you have any high level data that identifies construction cost uplift to achieve uh, a NZC uh, building? Rough percentages would be useful, please. That's a really good question. I'm going to pass to Simon in a second, but I'm just going to say, I think ultimately you're going to have, um, there's going to be almost like a carbon tax on stuff. So we're seeing carbon as a currency um, becoming more of a, a familiar term. So I suspect even if we can't really demonstrate very much at the moment, in the future, you're going to have to be doing it. Otherwise, it's going to cost you more. Um, but Simon, sorry, if you've got anything more specific on, on that particular question. No, I think it's it's a bit tricky as, as well because it's kind of what's the what's the starting point? Um, yeah. For the for these comparisons, I mean, there is there is actually some. I joined a really good uh, lecture the other day. There's a new tool out, a, re, a new release of the EcoLab Lab toolkit, um, and that's a really good tool that is looking at embodied carbon, operational carbon, but it's also worked with um, Curry and Brown to put um, cost data against it. And that's would be really worth uh, looking at because it allows you to make those some quite high level strategic, strategic decisions on different um, performances of building, but factoring in that cost 
I can also add, so we've done um, quite a lot of work under GLA schemes recently, and for the operational carbon, anything that you, for a major development, anything that you can't reduce through design in terms of operational energy, you have to offset, and the offset rate under the GLA schemes is set at £90 per tonne of carbon at the moment. So on a large mixed development, you can be looking at a really, really big bill in terms of just your operational. Now, they don't cover offsetting for the embodied carbon under the GLA requirements currently, but I can see that coming downstream as well in the near future, and that's going to make your price tag even bigger. So turning your question on its head in a way, Chris, what's the cost of going to be of not doing a net zero carbon building? Because I think that's going to be more of the question in the future as well. I jump in here just, just to pick up on something that Ab Abby mentioned. Um, she talked about carbon um, being a currency and treated as a, uh, a, a, a token or a, a coin of some sort. And the work that we're, we're doing here at Brooks has to do with the understanding of how carbon accounting and budgeting is going to link with um, decentralized finance or the blockchain. And the idea is that carbon, and there's quite a big movement towards this is that carbon is traded as tokens um, so that if you were to enter into a project you would have to pay for offsets and that those offsets would be um, the carbon currency the carbon market would be global um, decentralized and you'd also be able to sell carbon credits into the system so if you were in a if you owned a forest or a, uh, a peat bog and you were restoring it as many companies are actually doing right now you'd be able to um, claim credits for that and use it against your, your project. So, uh, so, the, so the idea of carbon as a currency is one that we're, we're really interested in. Yeah, that's really interesting. I was actually reading uh, recently, I think it's um, something called Planet Watch, which is that potentially along the same idea, which is about sharing data around kind of the air quality. Um, which is a slightly different different subject, but that kind of value in that data around kind of how performance, how buildings perform, and specifically kind of indoor environmental quality in that instance. Yeah, it's an interesting area. Thanks, thanks, Simon. I've, I've, I've noted that. Thanks. Uh, any other questions that I can coach out of, out of um, our participants? Uh, here we go. There's another one here in the chat, which I'll mention. Um, Building user guides are already required under new building leg. So can you include in that, and there's a follow-up to that already, how much do we need to be engaging with the supply chain and contractors to get to understand embodied carbon better? Yeah, so by the time the contractor is involved, the big decisions about embodied carbon will have been made. So it's you have to think about it before they're involved. And then you need to, as Simon showed in his example earlier, where they go and get things from has a big impact as well. So they're part of that discussion. I think it needs to be part of your early discussions with them. Yeah, I'd also add to it. So, so we've been doing some work with some local councils around their kind of carbon um, requirements. And one of the things that we've we've done with, with one of the councils is that they've um, developed their kind of change control forms. So when they've um, appointed contracts to deliver a project, if there's any element of change, typically their change control forms covered aspects of, of kind of costs, maintenance, um, robustness, things like that. But they've now added um, embodied carbon into those requirements that contractors have to report against. So if the contractor is looking to change a product, that's also going to be a kind of a serious consideration for it. But I think it is, you know, it is a bit of an issue trying to get, I think if you take embodied carbon data from suppliers outside of EPDs, I think you do have to potentially take it with a bit of a pinch of salt and sort of scrutinise it um, because it hasn't had that kind of independent verification that the EPDs bring. Um, obviously, it doesn't mean you can't, use it but you know just do those sort of sense checks around what's what they're saying if I, going back to the first note about building user guides i hadn't realized that and i find that really interesting i think it's quite important so if it's if it's required under the new building regs that's great because it's something we've always encouraged through things like um, briam or hqm we want there to be a little manual for whoever it is that's operating the building 
Thank you, Harry. No, that's helpful. Um, because if you've got that bit of package of information and you can put things in there about the EPDs and what the assumptions are with regards to how long these materials will last and what happens when they're done. So if there is a manufacturer take back scheme, for example, as you mentioned earlier, Simon, how would a homeowner or a building user know how to access that scheme without some sort of guide with a package of information for them? I think it's a great resource that we should be using more. I think I've actually sort of seen examples where some of that responsibility for the building is tied into potential kind of contracts. So clients are actually legally obliged to kind of deal with the materials in, in certain ways. I think with the circular economy momentum as well, we're going to see way more of that, which is which is what it, we need, isn't it, essentially? So it's great to hear that that's already starting. Well, see, uh, that's one comment on this. It looks as though the... The, some of the big financial institutions are actually putting pressure to ensure that carbon is accounted properly. And it may be that, that it's an unexpected driver, actually, to things. You don't get funding unless you, you do it properly. The other point I want to make, which Simon brought up, is this idea of appropriate accounting. And if, if we could do our carbon accounting as well as we do our financial accounting, I think we would be okay. I, I, I mean, there's a lot of trust associated with presenting your corporate results. But it's done so regularly, frequently, and there's relatively small amount of fraud, and uh, and we, we have to submit them to companies. We have to submit our 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 edited. If, if you're a listed company, you have to you have to go through all sorts of 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 um, of uh, you know auditing and so forth. So why shouldn't the same thing be done in the carbon sphere and treated it more of a currency and more of a financial statement mm. than anything else? Um, nope. And as I said at the beginning, we are seeing increasing pressure on developers in the um, financial sphere mm -hmm. as well. So you're not getting funding unless you can hit these ESG targets. Um, and, and sustainability carbon is a massive part of that. It has to be. But it, I, I have to say it, guys. I'm sorry. It's one of my things. It's not just carbon. There's a much bigger picture as well alongside the carbon piece with health and well-being and ecology, with the biodiversity stuff as well. It's, there's a whole load of different things that need to be taken into account. Uh, that's a, that's a, that's, it, in many ways, that's an excellent way to leave this discussion uh, to, to think about the sort of bigger picture and, um, and, and sort of the future. I, um, I've been asked, there have been a couple of questions about slides being available, and there have been some, uh, uh, there has been a issuing of the YouTube channel where I believe this talk will be available. Um, if there are any other questions, now is the time to ask either through the chat or on the Q&A panel. Um, and if there aren't any questions, I, we will, I will hang on the, uh, the Zoom site for a few minutes. If you want to leave um, parting comments or thanks, then I'll be sure to read them and pass them on to um, our panelists. Um, other than that, um, thank you all very much for attending. If, if the panelists have any final comments, I'd be, I'd be very glad to hear them now. Um, if not, then I'm, I'm also equally happy to, to close this session and to thank everyone for participating and for contributing. Uh, and also to Stuart, who was behind the scenes uh, doing the technology. Anyhow, thank you all very much. Um, yeah, thank you. Thanks, everybody.